O God, who makest the faithful to be of one mind and will, grant to thy people the grace to love what thou dost command and to desire what thou dost promise. Words taken from the Collect for this morning's Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Peace be to you. Many of the greatest kingdoms in the history of the world had great queens, or virtuous women, wives and mothers present at the top. They were around at key moments to make something special come about. Constantine the Great had his holy mother, St. Helena. She is always depicted wearing a crown. France became the eldest daughter of the church through the efforts, sufferings, and sacrifices of St. Clotilde, the wife of Clovis. It is arguably the pious Catholic Queen Bertha of Kent who disposed the leaders of England to convert when St. Augustine of Canterbury arrived from Rome, having been sent by St. Gregory the Great. St. Louis the Ninth surely owed much to his mother, Queen Blanche of Castile, for his solid, unflinching Catholic faith. Did she not tell her princely son she would rather see him dead than commit a single mortal sin? And she meant it. There's a true queen. Everyone knows that Spain achieved her greatness most especially through one of the world's finest queen mothers, Isabel the Catholic. I dare you to find a better queen that has reigned on this earth than Queen Isabel. You will look far and wide to find one. And looking over her life, it is obvious she was the glue that brought Spain together and held it together. Even though her name may not appear first on various important documents, it was she who made it happen. When she died, things started to come undone rather quickly. There's a reason why. The game of chess. If you know about the history of that game, it was modified after the defeat of the Muslim Moors in Granada. Most notably, the chess piece of the Queen. It was made to symbolize Queen Isabella, able to move easily and powerfully to support and protect the King. For this is precisely what she did all her life. Whether that king was the universal king, Christ Jesus our Lord, or her human husband, King Ferdinand, fighting some battle against the Muslim Moors. Finally, we might mention the greatness of Zita, blessed Karl of Austria's queen and wife. Did she not sustain him throughout his many trials? Would we have a blessed Karl without Zita? The same could be said of many other great kingdoms in history. St. Hedwig for Poland, St. Elizabeth or Isabel for Portugal, and so on. Thus, throughout history, it can be shown, it can be shown that many of the greatest kingdoms had great queens, virtuous women, wives and mothers, working in and around them, helping them to become great. Just as this is true of whole nations, it's also true of little kingdoms. Little kingdoms. Most notably, the Catholic family. The family is a little kingdom in itself. And the father and husband is a head of a state, a king to govern and guide the little kingdom that he has to guide it to heaven. He strives to make the path open and easily traveled, always seeking to remove obstacles and to prevent his subjects from going astray. In the wife and mother, the family has a queen seeking to aid the king and protect her subjects from harm and provide them 
needed sustenance. The family has its own set of laws, hopefully clearly marking out the boundaries between vice and virtue. It has its duties and its own economics. With these little sovereign states, the family, within the larger state of the nation, it should not surprise us that modern liberal republics, like our own, do not mind legalizing divorce. Why? Why can I say that? Because divorce is an easy way to get inside these little sovereign kingdoms and to divide them, to control their economics and to make their rules become like those of the nation. Liberal, making them submit to modern ways, making the church submit to the state. Think about it, when there's a divorce, the law gets in your life, in your marriage, in your family. They like that. That's why we should hate divorce and avoid it at all costs. Also, given this model, we might note this model of the family as a little kingdom. We might note that marital infidelity amounts to treason, a betrayal of the kingdom. And any man who can do this to his own kingdom will surely not hesitate long in betraying his country as well as his faith. Thus, what goes on in private can and does, oh yes, does very much affect how a person behaves toward the nation as a whole and to God in heaven. But again, great kingdoms Great families have in them a great queen mother. The scriptures indicate this in a variety of ways. Recall how the Antichrist-like Antiochus king in the Old Testament in the Maccabees brutally killed, brutally murdered all seven sons of one mother. 2 Maccabees chapter 7. He did this in an effort to break down that little family state holding out against the big state. And it was all to no avail. If you read 2 Maccabees chapter 7, Scripture indicates that clearly, without doubt, it was the mother who made this possible. The Apostle Paul says that St. Timothy owed his faith and goodness to his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. We know that all of these queens, big and small, are mere images. Images of the one great queen who is our blessed mother in heaven. She is the queen mother of a kingdom that is eternal. The kingdom of heaven. Consider the first Pentecost wherein the Holy Ghost descended upon her and then upon the holy apostles around her. Her crown then is, as it were, a fire and power of the Holy Ghost. And it is on display in the twelve stars of the apostles. Would they have been so great without drawing nigh unto her? No. Would they have been successful without her? No. And to think, this queenship of Blessed Mary is forever and ever and ever. It is eternal. It will have no end. She cannot and will not fail. She is much more like that queen chess piece than Isabella. Powerful and always around. St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, argues that her power is so great, only she is capable of checkmating the King of Kings. Now, there are many lessons here present for us today. Let's consider a few. Number one, these queens that I've mentioned today were not mere figureheads. They were not just beautiful and well-dressed women wearing a golden crown studded with jewels. 
They were consulted by their kings. They were loved by their kings. And they often helped them in difficult moments to produce great fruits. Even if they didn't have the final say, which they did not. That's the job of the king. But they should be consulted. What is more, they willingly suffered to merit graces for their kingdoms. Graces of conversion for their husbands and their subjects. One might say their lives followed the mysteries of the Most Holy Rosary. Joyful and taking on such an honored position. Sorrowful. Sorrowful. In realizing the depth of the task laid upon them and the merits required to make things happen. And finally, glorious in seeing the results that whole nations would convert to the faith, even whole continents under Isabel. We're one for Christ. That children whom they nourished in their wombs and at the breast would rise up to become saints for heaven, defending the faith and the rights of Holy Catholic Church until death, until the shedding of their blood. Ah, how much will these good queen mothers be honored in the general judgment? Only then will we see what they really did. And how much we have failed to appreciate them. How much we owe them. Now to prove this point, we only need to reflect on the King of Kings working with his blessed mother, who was queen. To do what? Change the water into wine at the first sacramental marriage of Cana. And he worked with her from that point on as the new Eve to overcome all hell on Calvary and likewise throughout all time. Some of the mystics like Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda explain that Christ the King consulted his queen often, even asking her permission to suffer and die on Good Friday. During this 100th anniversary of Fatima, we know well that he still works closely and intimately with his queen mother to bring peace to the church, to marriages, and to the family. Peace to all the nations of the earth, big and small, lest they be annihilated and suffer divorce-like breakdowns in civil and tribal warfare. This queen has given us the heavenly blueprint for peace that's undeniable. And we are not listening to her. We've ignored her. We've explained away her blueprint for peace and say dumb things like it's over while everybody stocks up on weapons, worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Hmm. Alas, dearly beloved, who can count the lost fruits of conversion and souls and whole nations that have already been destroyed from this insanity? We need to listen to her. Think about it. What is the essence of the Fatima message? It is contained in the threefold secret revealed on July 13, 1917. First of all, after giving them, these little children, a taste of heaven multiple times, heaven, then she shows them hell. These are the two ends. And she insists firmly that she wanted to prevent souls from being eternally destroyed in that fiery abyss down below. That was the first part of the message on July 13. Here's hell. I don't like it. And I don't want people to go there. This is what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to give you all I have. I'm going to give you my heart. My immaculate heart that's been wounded by men. She then showed us how to stop this sad demise of mankind. Even whole nations. How devotion and consecration to her immaculate heart. As well as praying the rosary devoutly every day. And then she later asked for the consecration of Russia directly and by name. 
something that is yet to happen as she asked. Third of all, the third part of the message is the saddest part of all. She showed how men and even leaders of the church will not listen to her plea. She prophesied. Instead, they will seek other paths to peace, but only experience the wrath of God symbolized by the angel with the flaming sword, as well as the sun coming down to threaten the earth on October 13 and the miracle of the sun. This is what we're going to get. No matter how hard we have tried since then, no matter what path we have chosen, dialogue. We just need more dialogue. And we will solve the world's problems. Blah, 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 blah. We need to water down the faith. We need the United Nations diplomacy. Nothing has worked but more and more war and unrest result. Yet as the third secret shows, somehow peace will come when the Pope leads the bishops, the priests, the religious, and the lay faithful up the steep mountain through the broken city of this world to die for the faith at the foot of the cross. Then peace will come through the conversion of sinners with the Queen Mother's Immaculate Heart being triumphant. This too is symbolized in the miracle of the sun during which Sister Lucia saw the Holy Family. Three successive images. First, she saw the Holy Family. Joyful mysteries, folks. Then she saw the Mother of Sorrows with our Lord dressed in red. Sorrowful mysteries. And then she saw Our Lady of Mount Carmel who's always depicted wearing a crown. The glorious mysteries. We are now in the sorrowful mysteries. Queens should be consulted, most especially the Queen of Heaven. That's the first lesson. The second lesson. The peace of a kingdom often comes through the Queen. The peace of a family can be best obtained and secured through a good and holy Queen Mother. It was Queen Esther's prayers and sacrifices in the Old Testament and later her directly approaching the king, Ahasuerus, that calmed his anger and turned the ties of destruction for God's people of old. Third lesson. The basic principle simply stated, as the leader, so the people, applies here. If the king and queen are virtuous, so will the subjects most likely become virtuous. If the king and queen behave badly, do bad things, visit bad places, they drag the whole kingdom with them. King David committed a sort of treason by falling in with Bathsheba, which brought about the death of their firstborn, as well as plague and division upon the whole nation of Israel. No king no queen lives unto themselves. They are heads of state. What they do affect all. As the leader, so the people. Finally, children should always honor their parents as subjects of old strove to honor their king and queen. Think about the knights of old that would die for their queen. Children should honor their family, the little kingdom of their father and mother, not wanting to commit any fault or sin that would bring shame upon them or tarnish the family name and reputation. How many children would not sin if only they would stop and think, what would my queen mother think of this? How would this hurt her? What will this do to my family if discovered? You want to be holy? That will help you. How will this affect my mom? What will this do to my family name? At Fatima, after the miracle of the sun, Sister Lucia recalled what struck her most. 
She said, all of the words spoken at this apparition, the words most deeply engraved upon my heart, are those of the requests made by our Heavenly Mother. Do not offend our Lord and God anymore, for he is already so much offended. How loving a complaint, she said, how tender a request. Who will grant me to make it echo throughout the world? Do not offend our Lord and God anymore, for he is already so much offended. The life of a faithful queen mother of the little kingdom of the family is surely modeled upon that of the queen of heaven. Joyful, sorrowful, glorious. Having joyfully accepted this position, may they endure the sorrows to merit the glory of the crown of heaven that will be given to them. Dear mothers, are you experiencing troubles? Are you in the sorrowful mysteries? I dare say you are. Stay the course. It will be worth it. As history shows, the greatest kingdoms, big and small, had great queen mothers present at the top. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.